moved out of my parents' house and into my own apartment. I had a lot of junk and stuff that I needed to get rid of. I never liked Craigslist because I always found it sketchy, especially after hearing so many stories about it. So, I listed a lot of my things on Facebook Marketplace, items that wouldn't fit in my apartment and that my dad wanted out of the house. This included some old childhood toys, book sets, and a whole bunch of other things. The weight set was what I listed for the most money. It had a barbell, a plate tree stand, and a bunch of plates. I was selling it for $340, which I thought wasn't a bad deal. Surprisingly, I wasn't getting many bites. Some people would inquire if the item was still available, then never message me again about it. Until a few days after posting it, a guy named Joe messaged me, showing interest. His profile picture was pretty grainy, but it was a guy with a fishing hat on, holding up a fish. His account info was private. I couldn't see how many friends he had or anything, only that we had three mutuals. All three of them were girls from my town. The guy's last name was also the last name of a Joe I knew from my town, who used to date a girl I was somewhat friendly with. So, I right away assumed it was him, especially since I knew that guy liked to fish. After telling him it's still available, he said, Great. When can I pick it up? I was pleasantly surprised he didn't try to haggle the price down at all. I said I'm available any night after 7 o'clock. He said he could come by tonight around 11 p.m. after work. I said that's fine, a little late in my opinion. But if that's what worked for his schedule, it worked for me. I then decided to just be a little friendly and said, Hey, you used to date Gina, right? I saw the typing indicator in the chat for a second, but then it went away, and he didn't reply for a couple of minutes. Then he said, yes. I thought it was a little strange, the random pause, but it could have been anything. Maybe he thought it was weird I brought it up. So I just said, I knew I recognized your name LOL. He read the message, but didn't respond for half an hour. Then I got a message back from him saying, yeah, LOL, can you send me your address and I'll let you know when I'm coming? So I sent him my address. He read it and didn't respond for many hours. By the time I got home from work, it was around six o'clock. I went to the gym and got back around 7.30. The whole time waiting for some kind of acknowledgement from Joe, he finally messaged back asking for my number. I gave it to him, and seconds later, I got a text from a number with our area code. I have an iPhone, and when I texted him back, it was green. I sometimes find that to be a red flag, and possibly scams, because most people I know have iPhones. But I wasn't thinking that way with this, because I knew this guy already. He said he'd be over in a few hours, and so I continued about my business. It was now around 11 o'clock, and I was waiting patiently for his text or call. I sent a follow-up saying, let me know when you're coming. It was around 11.30 that he texted me. I'm here, come out. I looked out the front window of my apartment and saw a dark-colored car out front in the street. I tried calling him so I could tell him that I needed help bringing the weights outside. Rejected my call, and then he texted again. Yo, come out. I texted back. I see you. You can come in. I just need help with the weights. There's a lot of them. He texted back. Nah, gotta see if you're straight first. I had to process what the hell that even meant for a second. All I knew was this did not seem like the way this white fishing dude would be texting. I tried calling one more time, and he denied the call again. Now I was suspicious. I decided to text that girl Gina 
along with the mutual friends I had with Joe on Facebook. The first one to text back was this girl, Angela, who said, OMG, that's a catfish. Someone was pretending to be him. When I asked why she added it, she said it must have been a different name when it added her. I looked out the window again, and the car was still there. Someone was about to do something bad to me. I wasn't sure what or who or why. I had no way to contact the real Joe, because he didn't seem to have any actual social media profiles, not public at least. I kept the door shut and locked and didn't respond any further. I turned off the light in the living room and peeked the blind just a bit. And I swear on my life, there was a guy hiding behind one of the bushes in front of the house. I watched until the car outside honked its horn. And then I saw the guy in the bushes run to the car. And then the car sped off. Witnessing that, I didn't feel relief. I felt gut-wrenching fear. Not only of what I just narrowly avoided, but the fact that those people now had my address. The Facebook profile was deleted the next day, after a bunch of people reported it. Though I think the people who made the account deleted it, or deactivated it themselves. Joe himself confirmed he had nothing to do with any of that, and that someone must have been using his pictures and name to try and scam people in the area. Though I'm not so sure it was someone trying to scam random people, because days later, I got this threatening text. Hey yo, watch your back. We know where you live. Keep trying to talk to my girl. See what happens, man. Will you up right outside your crib? Sleep with one eye open, we watching. I brought this to the police, but it was such a low priority report to them that I doubt they even looked into it. I have no reason to lie when I say I haven't tried talking to anyone's girl in the slightest. At the time of this incident, I had been seeing a girl pretty much exclusively. I think it's connected. I don't know who it is. I don't know what they were going to do to me if I opened the door. Unfortunately, I've had to live in slight fear in my new apartment ever since moving here. Fortunately, I haven't gotten any more threatening or random texts, but I still pretty much always check outside my windows first before leaving the apartment at night. It had to be 2018. I was selling this old pinball machine that we had to deal with in my parents' house. It wasn't some crazy arcade-level pinball machine that would cost thousands of dollars, but it was definitely worth a few hundred bucks. It had been sitting in my parents' attic for the longest time, so I wanted to sell it before one of my sisters had the same idea. I didn't really want anyone to know about this, because then I'd have to split the money so I chose to list it when my family was away on a trip that I couldn't go on due to work. I'm a bit of a sneak, I know, but you gotta do what you gotta do. My parents' house is on the really nice side of town, but not in a gated community. I put the pinball machine up on Facebook Marketplace for $200. The next day, I got a message from an account with no profile picture, with the name Jasmine, expressing interest in the pinball machine. They offered $175, and I agreed to that number. We set up a time for when she would come, but when that time came, she never showed up. She messaged me, saying, I'll be there soon. It was getting late now, and I had work the next day. I asked her if she would be here by 11, the latest. She said 11.30, I asked if we could do this tomorrow instead, but she said she's already on her way. So, I just stayed up a little later waiting. 11.45 rolls around, and she finally tells me that she's here. I went to the front door and saw there was a car out front. What I wasn't expecting was to see all four doors of the car opening and four people stepping out, one girl and three guys. I messaged her, are you here with people? 
At this point, she wasn't answering her messages anymore. I watched as the four people approached my door. I kept the storm door locked. These three guys looked kind of big. And all four of these people looked like trouble. As they got close enough, I said, Are you Jasmine? She said through the door, Yeah. I said, I can't let all of you guys in my house. My parents are asleep, obviously lying. Jasmine, or so she claimed her name was, tried opening the door, yelling, What are you talking about? As she saw it was locked, she started knocking on the glass. I decided it was best to shut the front door at this point. I heard their voices yelling outside for a while and the doorbell ringing. I heard one of the guys, or maybe even multiple of them, yelling obscenities and insults at me through the two doors, making me only gladder. I didn't let them in. These were not the kinds of people I wanted to deal with in my parents' house. Her place finding some of the stolen items from my house. It turned out that the people involved were known for this type of criminal activity. And my case wasn't their first offense. While I was relieved that they were caught, it still left me with a lingering sense of unease, especially in my parents' house when I was alone. I realized this whole thing was an awful idea when I heard their voices laughing and yelling on the front stoop for like 10 minutes after I shut the door. I looked out my little brother's bedroom window upstairs, which is directly above the driveway, and I saw one of the guys urinating in the empty driveway. With no cars in the driveway, it was not a good look. The girl yelled something directed at me as they finally started to walk away, but I didn't hear what it was. I just thanked the Lord when they drove away, and I went upstairs to go to sleep. I was having trouble sleeping that night, though, thinking of the interaction. Fully awake a couple of hours after climbing into bed, I heard a crash from downstairs. It was unmistakably the sound of a window being shattered. I sprang up, but right before sprinting to make sure the bedroom door was locked, I stopped myself. Instead, I quietly got out of bed and tiptoed to the door. I had already locked it. I tiptoed back to my bed, phone in hand, ready to call 911. For some stupid reason, I was waiting until I heard any other kind of sounds before dialing. And eventually, I heard the sound I needed to hear. Footsteps rapidly coming upstairs. I dialed 911 as I felt like throwing up. The footsteps outside the room didn't even sound like they were trying to be quiet. I whispered the entire time I was on the line with the dispatcher. Time was moving in reverse. I hid literally under my bed as I listened to people ransacking the house. In reality, they were in and out in less than five minutes, way before the police actually showed up. The backyard window was shattered. Things were stolen from just about each room. Ironically, the pinball machine wasn't taken. What happened from there was I got a police report number. I made an appointment to see a couple detectives at the police station and shared with them all the details I had including the Facebook account of the Jasmine girl. I fabricated the story of it, saying someone in the house threatened me. My reasoning for this was that I felt this case would actually be taken seriously if I claimed I was threatened. To my surprise, they did take this seriously. The detectives apparently gathered the necessary data of the Facebook account in question to track this Jasmine girl who lived a few towns over in a less than desirable area. With a search warrant, they searched her place, finding some of the stolen items from my house. It turned out that the people involved were known for this type of criminal activity, and my case wasn't their first offense. Melvin assured me that he was already at the precinct 
and would be waiting there for me. Martina and I hopped in the car and made the hour-long journey to the police precinct. When we arrived, I texted Melvin to let him know we were there. He responded promptly, saying he was in a silver sedan parked near the entrance. As we approached the car, I noticed something off. The windows were heavily tinted, and I couldn't see inside. Martina and I exchanged uneasy glances, but I decided to proceed cautiously. I texted Melvin, asking him to step out of the car so we could see the phone and complete the transaction outside. His response was delayed, but he finally agreed. A tall man stepped out of the silver sedan, and his face was immediately familiar. It was Melvin, the same guy who had tried to scam me with the pinball machine incident. My heart raced as I realized I had unknowingly arranged to meet the same person who had previously targeted me. Martina and I immediately turned around, rushing back to our car. Melvin shouted after us, claiming there must be a misunderstanding. Ignoring him, we quickly left the precinct and drove away. I couldn't believe the audacity of this person to attempt another scam after what had happened before. The experience left me shaken, but I was grateful for Martina's presence and her quick thinking. It served as a stark reminder to always exercise caution and thoroughly vet sellers, even when dealing in seemingly secure locations. After this incident, I became more vigilant when making online transactions, ensuring my safety and avoiding potential scams. N, and indeed, it was a black Ultima with its hazard lights on. My heart sank as I realized we were in a potentially dangerous situation. Martina urged me to keep driving, insisting that it was too risky. I agreed with her this time and sped away from the location. As we drove, I called Melvin back, telling him that we couldn't find the spot and decided to head home. He seemed frustrated, but didn't push further. Reflecting on the situation, Martina and I realized just how unsafe and suspicious the entire setup was. The secluded location, the story about the car trouble, and the late night meeting in the middle of nowhere were all red flags. We were relieved that we followed our instincts and didn't proceed with the encounter. From that point on, I became even more cautious about online transactions, especially when dealing with unfamiliar locations and sellers. The incident served as a crucial lesson about the importance of prioritizing safety over potential deals and being aware of the potential risks associated with online transactions. Martina and I decided to spend the rest of the night doing something much safer, like grabbing dinner and enjoying a relaxing evening to shake off the unnerving experience. Counter keeps staring at us. She chuckled nervously, and we continued chatting while keeping an eye on him. The waitress brought our coffees, and the man at the counter kept to himself, occasionally sipping his coffee. Martina suggested that we finish our food quickly and leave just to be on the safe side. I agreed, and we tried to enjoy our meal while keeping the mysterious man in our peripheral vision. However, he didn't seem to be eating or engaging in any conversation with the waitress. As we were finishing up, the man abruptly stood up and walked towards our table. My heart raced and Martina tensed up. He stopped right next to us, looking directly at me. In a low, gruff voice, he said, You're the guy who just passed me, aren't you? I was taken aback, but decided to stay calm. I have no idea what you're talking about, I replied, trying to diffuse the situation. The man continued staring at me for a moment, then turned and left the diner without saying another word. Martina and I were relieved, but puzzled by the encounter. 
we paid our bill quickly and left, deciding it was best to put distance between us and the diner. While driving away, I received more calls and texts from Melvin, expressing frustration and anger. It was clear that we had narrowly escaped a potentially dangerous situation. Martina and I agreed that we were done with any attempts to meet Melvin or pursue the questionable phone deal. The incident at the diner served as another reminder to trust our instincts and prioritize our safety. It also highlighted the unpredictable and sometimes unsettling aspects of online transactions. We decided to head home, grateful that the night had taken an unexpected turn, but ultimately ended without any harm. Must have done something to my car while we were at the diner. I pulled over to the side of the highway to check, and sure enough, one of my tires was almost completely flat. Martina and I were now genuinely scared. It was late at night, and we were stranded on the side of the highway, possibly being followed by a guy who had already proven himself to be untrustworthy and potentially dangerous. I called for roadside assistance and explained the situation to them. They assured me they would send someone to help with the tire. While waiting for assistance, we kept an eye out for any sign of the guy from the diner. Every passing car made us uneasy, wondering if it was him. I also continued receiving angry messages from Melvin, blaming me for the failed meetup and accusing me of trying to scam him. When the roadside assistants arrived, they quickly replaced the flat tire with the spare. The technician mentioned that it looked like the tire had been deliberately punctured, likely with a sharp object. Hearing this sent shivers down our spines, confirming our suspicions that Melvin was indeed involved. With the spare tire on, we cautiously continued our journey home, constantly checking our surroundings for any signs of the black car or Melvin. Fortunately, we made it back without further incidents, but the whole experience left us deeply unsettled. This ordeal reinforced the importance of staying vigilant during online transactions and being cautious about meeting strangers in unfamiliar locations. Martina and I were grateful to have each other's support throughout the night and relieved to arrive home safely. What an absolutely harrowing experience. It's fortunate that you and Martina were able to navigate through such a dangerous situation and come out of it safely. It indeed serves as a powerful reminder to stay cautious during online transactions and to prioritize personal safety. The fact that you can now look back on it as a crazy story emphasizes the resilience and strength you both demonstrated in that situation. May all your future transactions be safe and trouble-free. If you have any more segments to add or need further assistance, feel free to share 